In this video, I'm going to go over some specific formulas for your most common t-tests and z-tests. And what I want you to focus on and think about while we do this is not the differences between the formulas. I want you to focus on the similarities between the formulas. Now, yes, at some point you do need to focus on what the differences are, but if you just focus on everything being different, you're going to think that we're covering you know, 10, 12, 13 different formulas here, but it's really just one formula with some slight variations from case to case. And so whenever you see a Z or a T test, you're going to see a pattern emerge where the Z or the T that you're calculating on the top of the formula in the numerator, you are going to see some sort of deviation, some sort of difference between two numbers. And then on the bottom of the formula, you're going to see some sort of standard error. Remember, a standard error is a common difference between what samples will give you and what your null hypothesis says. Or uh, another way of thinking of it is it's a common difference between a sample estimate and the truth, assuming you know the truth, or assuming that the null hypothesis represents the truth. And so after you calculate this Z or T statistic, you're going to calculate a p-value or compare your Z or T statistic to some critical value based on an alpha. And so I'm going to assume that you have an idea of what alpha is. Let's just say it's 0.05, the probability of committing a type 1 error and that you know how to look up a critical value for a Z or a T. That being said, let's go through and look at these formulas. And again, just keep this pattern in your head. A deviation, a difference between two numbers on the top, and a standard error on the bottom in the denominator. So for Z tests, the simplest Z test that we went through in a previous lecture, uh, for one sample proportion, comparing that one sample proportion to some kind of null hypothesis value. So the example we did, we looked at testing is a coin fair. Is it 50%? So that's the null hypothesis, that the population of flips belongs to a coin that is 0.5 probability of heads. So comparing what we get in a sample to that 0.5, here's how we calculate a Z. P bar is the proportion of a sample of flips that were heads. P zero is what is your hypothesis about what proportion of heads uh, flips should be heads. And then on the bottom, you're going to divide that by a standard error. And the formula for that standard error is the square root of P times 1 minus P over the square root of N, as we saw before. Now, uh, if you have two sample proportions, say we take a sample of males and a sample of females, and we want to see if the sample of males that are conservative is the same, is equal to the uh, proportion of females that are conservative. The null hypothesis would say the proportion of males in the entire population that are conservative is equal to the proportion of females in the entire population that are conservative. But all we have is a sample. So what would we do? Well, we'd calculate a Z statistic. That's what we always use for proportions. And the Z statistic would calculate what is the sample difference? What is the difference between the proportion of males and females that are conservative? from your sample. So take the two samples, calculate the proportion in the two samples that are conservative. That's what I mean by the sample difference in proportions. And then compare that to the hypothesized difference in, prof in proportions. In the null hypothesis I just stated that the proportion of males is equal to the proportion of females, this hypothesis size difference is simply zero. And that's the most common form that you see for these um, hypothesis tests is the hypothesized difference, zero. You're assuming they're equal in your null hypothesis. 
So it really just comes down to this uh, sample difference. And we want to see if that sample difference is statistically significant. So we take that difference in the samples, divide it by a standard error, and here's what our standard error looks like. Now this standard error looks just like this standard error for proportions with two very small differences. First of all, instead of a P, we have a P bar. And this P bar, there are different, several different ways people do this. The most common way that I'm familiar with is this P bar is the overall proportion of people in both samples, males and females, pooled together that are conservative. So you look at all your data and you forget about whether someone is male or female for a moment and you calculate the overall proportion p bar that are conservative and you put that p bar into this standard error formula right here and also right here and then instead of dividing by the square root of n you divide by the square root of how many people were total together in both samples so it's still the square root of n in a way so that's not really a big difference now Another kind of z-test that you'll see is for a hypothesis test involving either one mean or two means compared when you know the population standard deviation. Now to tell the truth it's not often that you know the population standard deviation in the real world but a lot of times you'll see a problem where you'll ask to assume that you know the population standard deviation. In order to do that kind of z-test, if you have one mean and you're comparing it to a null hypothesis value, for example, my null hypothesis says that the average IQ of people in my neighborhood is equal to 100. So I'm going to collect a sample of people's IQs in my neighborhood and compare it to the number 100. So I take the sample and calculate the sample mean, x bar, and then I subtract off mu naught. That's that average that was in the null hypothesis, the 100 number I said. And then you divide that by a standard error. Okay, simple enough. How do you calculate the standard error? It's the square root of the population variance, which is just the population standard deviation, divided by the square root of n. You can either do the division and then take the square root or you can take the square roots and then divide to get that standard error either way. Now what if you have two means and you assume you know the population standard deviations? Same kind of idea. You take the sample difference, take the two sample averages, calculate the difference. Now the null hypothesis here again might be pretty sim similar to what we had with the two proportions. We might assume that the IQ Here's our null hypothesis. The average IQ for males is equal to the average IQ for females. We take a sample of males and a sample of females and we want to compare, see if there is a difference. So we, calc we take the two samples, calculate the difference between our two sample means between males and females. That goes here. And then we subtract off, what did we think the difference was going to be based on our null hypothesis? Well, in the null hypothesis I just stated, we assumed that difference was zero in our null hypothesis. Males are equal to females, the difference is zero. And again, that's the most common kind of situation that you see. Uh, and then we divide that by a standard error. So we're, we're seeing the same pattern. The only slightly new thing is we assume we know the two standard deviations for the, for the two samples. Here's how we calculate the standard error. It's basically a weighted averaging of the two known standard deviations. And this formula becomes a little bit simpler if, we, if those two uh, standard deviations or variances happen to be equal that we both know. But again, it's not a very complicated formula. The variance of the first group divided by the, the first sample size the variance of the second group divided by the second sample size, you sum those two and take the square root to get the standard error. Now you can only use a z 
test for means when you assume you know the population standard deviation. Usually you don't, and so we have to use a t-test instead. The t-distribution was created for situations by student, also known as William Gossett, for situations when you don't know the population standard deviation. And so since I'm at the 10 minute mark, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here and pick up with t-tests in the next section.